you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm chapter 23. And Ben, my voice is a little weak today, so if I get a little bit more monitor, please. And pray in here. Thank you, Ben. Pray in. Thank you, praise team. Didn't they do a great job? Yes. Sounded great. Amen. Thank you so much. And um, I just felt like the Lord dropped this in my heart. And so hopefully this is a blessing to somebody. Uh, but Psalm 23, if you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not there, say amen. We will patiently wait. <laughs> you're there. Okay. I was there. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. I want you to notice this next phrase in verse 3. He restoreth my soul. That's what I want to talk about today. He restoreth. My soul. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness today. Thank you for your word. I pray that you will help us to absorb the word of God. Open up our hearts and our minds to receive the word. And Lord, let your word bring healing and spiritual health to your people today. Somebody that may be in need of restoration, I pray that this word would be a word of encouragement to them that there is hope. That restoration, Lord, is possible. But it's only possible, Lord, through your power and the working of your spirit and word in our lives. And let the church say amen. Amen. You can be seated. We're all familiar with Psalm 23. Amen. Amen. At least we should be. (laughs) I don't know how you can be saved and not know about Psalm 23. (laughs) But... um, I don't plan on being lengthy today, um, but I just feel like this is the direction to go. So you all with me today? You're probably like, I don't know, Pastor, depends. Let's let's wade into the water, and I'll let you know if I'm going out there with you. So (laughs) to restore. Now, how many of you all got a Windows operating system? Let me see your hand. (laughs) Windows operating, Microsoft. Good old Microsoft. Okay, how many uh, Apple folk do we have here? Okay, we'll pray for you. Um, (laughs) Pray for the pastor's wife. My wife's a big fan of Apple. I'm still into the Microsoft because of of business and stuff. It still seems to be more compatible. Apple's a lot more fun. But regardless of the system, and those of you with Windows are probably very familiar with System Restore. So if you get a bug and a virus in your computer, and I'm not a computer buff, but the times that we've gotten things in our computer, there's one one thing you can do to take it back to fa- factory settings, and that's a System Restore. And, and that'll get rid, from my understanding, that restores the computer back to factory settings to the original intent, to the original condition of that computer. So whatever you had on the computer is gone. If you didn't save it, it's gone. I mean, there's an option to system restore and save certain files, but that's not a complete reboot. To restore is to turn or return to the starting point. He restoreth my soul. There's times we need a System restore for our soul. To restore also means to be safe, to be or make complete, to bring back to a normal condition or completed condition. To restore speaks of returning something that was lost, broken, or decayed to its original condition and purpose. How many of y'all familiar with Fixer Upper? That's like a system restore. That's restoring. Maybe not back to the original condition, but it's definitely an upgrade. 
flip or flop and all these people that flip houses and do all these things and what they do to those homes. That, that kind of gives you what we're, what we're going to today. I have a, a client that um, I feel like every time I visit him, I'm going back 50, 60, 70 years. And he lives here in North Idaho. And uh, great guy, great individual, farmer, and, and a lot of street smarts. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we just, he, he's a client on the insurance side of our business, been for years, and I'll drive out there every now and then. I've been thinking about him a lot, a lot the last uh, couple weeks, few weeks. And he lives on a beautiful piece of property, and it, it's, it's off. It's not on grid. It's, it's out there. And beautiful, though. You get back out there in those foothills and stuff, it's gorgeous, the pasture land, the woods. But I always noticed his house set very high on one of the pastures, one of the, one of the hills there. But he had, a, he had this little shop down quite a ways, and then further down he had this long kind of, um, I don't want to call it a shop, but just this long covering, just almost an open garage type thing. And kind of like those uh, apartments where you park under, you know, and you can park 30 cars or 30 cars long with that type of thing. So I always wondered what that was. So one day, I knew I got on the inside track when he says, well, man, let me show you around. I've been out there a few, several times. He shows me around, and I'm telling you what. I mean, this, this guy loves to restore stuff to its original condition. He makes his own tongue and groove and sells it to the local hardware store. And he uses machinery back from the 40s and 50s that all work. And I'm like blown away at this. Everything works on the property. And then he takes me, that's the little shed, and then he takes me further down to that real long open kind of area, you know, covered area, and uh, doesn't have walls. It's just a, and, and, and then it dropped off a few feet, and there's all of these cars. So it's all hid from view. You got to look and look down. All these restored cars. And he buys cars, and he restores them. I mean, you're going back to cars from 19, probably 1910, 1920. I mean, just mind-blowing. And he buys them, and he restores them. We just met one of our neighbors here last week, and we're walking along, and I said, wow, never met him before, but his garage was open, and he's out there working in his garage. Beautiful. Was it in a 1957 Cadillac? Gorgeous. Tri-color, you know, it had plum color, and then it had an ivory. And I mean, it was, it was immaculate, restored. It had been a work in progress for him. But man, we started talking. We were there probably an hour. And he's showing us all the detail about this Cadillac, man. And we're just like, wow, this is, yeah, remember the neighbor? Yeah, you were there. You need to pay attention to the preaching, Sister Joan. This is my wife, by the way, so we can. Okay, so restored. We're talking about being restored. Now, he didn't, it wasn't new. At one point it was, but that thing got, you know, pretty beat up and dirty and, and had, was far, far away from how it looked when it came off the showroom. But he restored it. Just as my client restored all of these cars that most of us will look like that belongs in the junk, you know, junkyard. No, those people have an eye. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good year right there. That, that's a nice model year right there. I can do something with that. We're like, we would look at it like, man, there ain't nothing to do with that. That thing's just a, you know, that's just rusted out, and that's, that's just junk. Yeah, now that's how humans see things, and there's a few humans that can see the value in that and what they can do. But God sees us like that, too. He sees us when we are far from our original condition and purpose, which really the ultimate is salvation because what was lost in Eden and sin, Christ came and died and brought us back into perfect relationship with him. That's the ultimate restoration is salvation in knowing Jesus Christ. But what about for us that know Jesus Christ and we now are in need of restoration? David was a man after God's own heart. 
And he said, he restoreth my soul. Well, the only way David would be able to make that statement is if his soul at some point needed to be restored. Many things are restored. Houses that get dilapidated and old become restored. Look what's gone on in Coeur d'Alene. I mean, you got homes. I mean, my goodness. I'm glad the market is finally leveled out here. But you got homes built in the early 1900s that were going for sale for five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000. And then if they got restored, like new paint, new kitchen, new cabinets, new flooring, new carpet, new trim, new paint, new plumbing, new wiring, some of those homes would go for almost a million dollars right down here. Now, folks, I remember when we looked at those when we first came, and, I mean, you might get 150000 That's how much the market's gone up. But homes can need to be restored. Classical cars, computers, system restore. And as Christians, there are times in living for God that we experience tremendous loss, decay, Brokenness. Now, I'm not going to preach. I'm going to just talk to you today, okay? We can lose the passion of our first love with Christ. We can lose our passion for God. We can suffer losses. We can suffer hardships. We can suffer trials, attacks from the enemy. We can lose our joy, our purpose, our zeal for life. We can experience tremendous loss that breaks us. We can experience tremendous loss that breaks us. We can experience situations that except for the grace of God would leave us disillusioned, confused, broken. It could be the loss of a loved one, the loss of a relationship, the loss of health. Life can leave us broken and damaged, depressed and lonely. But God is a restorer of the soul. I wish life at times was not as hard as it is. Now, I guess if you're a female, you probably got one up and a little bit more mercy than, than if you're a male because I remember when Job went through his deal, God spoke to him at the end of it all and says, get up, Job, and answer me like a man. <laughs> I kind of scratched my head at that. Like, you mean after all that Job went through, and God approaches him, not, oh, poor little Job, I know, you know. Uh, Job, get up and act and answer me like a man. I never see, see him saying that about to a woman, but to the man. So, so that's kind of sometimes when I go through some things, Brother Jesus, it's like, okay, you know, I, I can only belly ache so much because eventually that verse comes to my mind. Man up. Be a man. Just a side note. But regardless of male or female, we're all going to suffer loss at some point. True. I hate to say this, but sometimes, let me say it like this. The one that betrayed Jesus was close to Jesus. Yeah. It came from the inner circle there of the twelve. David said, it's, it's a faithful friend that has betrayed me. If it was an enemy, I could have taken it. But we went to the house of God together. We took sweet counsel of the Lord together. And this is the one that has betrayed me. It broke David. Talking about David, he had been through a lot of things. 
He fought a lion. He fought a bear. He fought Goliath, victorious over all, anointed king, and then Saul rose up. I want to say Saul. That put David on the run for several years. A backslidden king trying to kill the new anointed king. And then after Saul, you've got Absalom, David's own son, that caused a conspiracy and a rebellion and tried to usurp the kingship from David and put David on the run. You don't think that caused David some brokenness and loss? You don't think Saul trying to kill him caused some brokenness and loss? What about one of David's wives, Michael, when, he saw, when she saw David uh, worshiping the Lord, bringing the ark to Jerusalem, and she, she basically all but cursed David. Oh, boy, didn't you make a spectacle of yourself out there today? And he said, man, you've not, I'm paraphrasing, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> and God shut up her womb as, 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 as a result of that. So an attack from his own wife, criticizing the way that he worshiped God. What about David's own sin with Bathsheba and marriage, and, 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 and then not marriage, but murder, murder of Bathsheba's husband? David's enemies, unprovoked, attacking him. The list can go on. David suffered seasons of loss and brokenness. Hence, we can see he restoreth my soul. At one point, David said he was like a broken vessel. If you look with me in Psalm 31, verse 9. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. I want to say trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief. I'm going to say grief. Grief, grief. Trouble and grief go hand in hand many times. Yea, my own soul and belly. I mean, to the core of the core, I'm consumed with grief. For my life is spent with grief. My life is spent with grief. Anybody been there? Boy, this is like a somber service. I'm not trying to depress anybody, but there is a reality here. And my years, some things go on for a while, folks. Some things you don't get over with overnight. Some things, some valleys you got to walk through that it's going to take years. And my years with what? Sighing. What happened? Thinking about it. Oh, man. When's this ever going to end? My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. I was reproached among all mine enemies. I guess that's not a bad thing. I mean, they are your enemies but especially among my neighbors and a fear to my acquaintance. They that did see me without fled from me. My, my neighbors and my acquaintances took off. They abandoned me in my time of greatest need. They left. They went out and partied and had a good time knowing that my whole world just fell apart. I mean, with friends like that, who needs enemies? But you got enemies too, and you're a reproach to them. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I may as well have been in the grave. Everyone's forgotten about me. I am like a broken vessel. I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. But here's the key, folks. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I trusted in thee. The only way that you're going to get through a season like that is to keep your trust in God. Amen. David knew what it was like to be broken, forgotten, slandered, lied about, spending his years with grief and sighing and sorrow. 
Not days, not weeks, not months, years. And yet David said, I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to trust in the Lord, my God. Lord, in the midst of all the pain and all the sorrow and all the grief and all the sighing and how weeks have turned into months, have turned into years, and it looks like there's no way out, one thing, I'm going to continue to trust you, Lord. I'm going to continue to put my trust in you no matter what the circumstance says, no matter what the situation says, no matter what the devil whispers in my ear, I'm going to put my trust and keep my trust in you I'm going to trust in the Lord with all of my heart and I'm not going to lean to my own understanding because my understanding in times of brokenness and despair if I listen to that that'll pull me away from God but somewhere in the midst I've got to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, continuing to trust God, continuing to rely on God, continuing to acknowledge him in all of my ways. So, saint of God, God is still in the business of restoration. God is still in the business of restoring a person's broken soul. We know what happened with Saul. Eventually, Saul died on the battlefield, and David was anointed king. He was already anointed. He was set up in in Judea to be king. And then seven years later, Israel. We know what happened with Absalom. He died on the battlefield, and David was able to come back to Jerusalem and continue to reign. We know what happened with David's sin with Bathsheba and his murder. God forgave him. God allowed him to live. And God gave him a second chance. He restored David. In all of these accounts, God is a restorer. So if anybody knows what he's talking about when he says, He restoreth my soul, is David. And if nothing else, you can lean and learn from David. The Old Testament was written for our example that we can learn from those in the Old Testament. Here's an Old Testament testimony for you, an encouraging word from you or for you. You are in need of restoration today. That is not a sin. Those that are in need of restoration, that is not a sin. That does not mean that your faith is broken. It does not mean necessarily that your trust in God needs to be restored. Most of us in hardship continue to trust God, but the situation breaks us. The situation messes with us, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it seems that there's no end in sight, but there is an end in sight because to everything, there is a purpose under the sun. There is a season of life that goes on, and you may be in a season right now of brokenness, but you're going to enter a season of restoration. The church can't restore your soul. It can assist. That's why it's so important to come to the house of God. Because you get amongst the people of God. And it's not the people of God that are going to restore your soul. But as we praise God together and we worship God together and we lift up his name, what begins to happen? The praises of God inhabits his people. The presence of God begins to move. And when the presence of God begins to move, healing is in his presence. Salvation is in his presence. Restoration is in his presence. See, it always goes back to Jesus. Pastor can't restore your soul. The saint can't restore your soul. You might be saying, hey, yeah, that's kind of been why I need restoration. My wife and I walked through a very dark valley, long valley, that just recently shifted a 10-year season of testing. And thank God we're on the other side. But we know what it's like to be in need of restoration. We've been there. We know what it's like. Some of you can testify that you've been there. Some of you are in it right now, and if you were like us, you're wondering, where is this going to end? When is this going to end? How is this going to end? 
I don't see any anything, any indication this is going to change. This is just a little word of faith for you today. Eventually it will change. Eventually restoration will happen. I wish ours happened overnight. I wish I could tell you, man, we had it, and boom, it just, man, God just moved, and we were just instantly healed, and we just moved on from life. Now, maybe some people have that testimony. That's not our testimony. Our testimony, though, is of the keeping grace and mercy of God. That you know what? We're going to stick it out. We're going to keep our trust in you, Lord. We're going to keep loving you. We're going to keep our spirit right. We're going to pull back from a lot of things because we got a lot we've got to work through. But we're going to keep our faith in you, our trust in you, our hope in you because you're the only one that I know that can restore us and turn this whole situation around. And we can stand here today and tell you with the faithfulness of God like David that he restoreth my soul. This is to encourage you today that if you're in need of restoration, that is not a sin. There's nothing wrong with needing to be restored. Oh, I got a lack of faith. Oh, I can't. I can never be down. I can never be sad. You know, I don't understand people like that. I don't know what planet they live on. I don't know what they've been... Smoking, that's what I was going to say. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief and yet without sin. Jesus knew what it was like to have grief. Jesus knew what it was like to have sorrow. I mean, the Bible's true. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. That's why it's so powerful that when God was manifest in the flesh in the person of Christ, he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities because he was made as like unto one of us yet without sin. Fully, completely human yet without sin. He wasn't a spirit being. He was a spirit being, God, who was a spirit that made himself flesh. Why? To die for the sins of the world and to shed his blood for us. But in the process, he was also tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be put out from the inner crowd. He knows what it's like to be ridiculed, to be lied on, to be slandered, to be ostracized. To have a death warrant. You know, there's some places Jesus wouldn't go because they sought to kill him. He didn't do it until it was his hour. So even our Lord, that's what's so beautiful. That's why his spirit, when it comes, the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, it is our comforter. He's our restorer. He's not just our Savior. He is our restorer. He wants to restore you. You read about Genesis. Uh, you guys got a few more minutes in you? Okay. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. There's a principle here. Well, look at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And what happened? The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then what happened? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 6, God said. Verse 9, God said. Verse 11, and God said. Verse 14, and God said. And verse 20, and God said. And verse 24, and God said. And verse 26, and God said. And now we enjoy a beautiful earth with the trees and the rivers and the mountains and the valleys and the deserts and all the animals and the creatures and the stars and the planets all because God's spirit moved where there was no form, it was empty, it was dark, it was lifeless. But when God's spirit moved and his word was spoken, look at what happened. We enjoy a beautiful creation. It took some time. Didn't happen just in one hour. Now, I personally believe it took six literal days. To create heaven and earth, that's up for debate. I don't think that's a heaven or hell issue. That's just my personal view. Some people say, you know, it could be ages, you know, whatever. So we're not, that's not the point of this Bible study. The point here is that 
Your life could be chaotic with no form to it, completely void, full of darkness, full of confusion. You're like, I need to be restored. How do I get restored? How can God take such a mess and make something beautiful out of this? Let me tell you how. You get into a place where the Spirit of God can move on your heart and on your life, and you let God's Word speak to you, and in the process, little by little by little, there is going to be a beautiful creation take place, and you will get to a day that you look back and you say, oh, by the grace of God, look what the Lord has done for me. Look how God has brought me out. Man, look how God has restored me and taken my feet out of a slippery place and planted my feet on a rock. You might be in the storm of your life right now. I want to encourage somebody in the Holy Ghost. I know that it's hard. I know that it's difficult. But I also know that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to his riches and glory. God has a way of taking a mess and turning it into a testimony. He's got a way of working a miracle. He alone can only do things that nobody else can do like restoring your soul. Yes. So my encouragement to you is keep your trust in God. Yes. Keep trusting God. Don't quit on God. Amen. You know what? I don't know how, if I, how plain I should get. And I, don't, I, don't, I really don't want this to come across wrong. But there are, see, and I think we've all felt like this. God, I certainly love you, but sometimes I really struggle with your people. <laughs> Yay, man. <laughs> you ever read the dialogue between God and Moses yeah. and Israel? Yeah. I mean, that's like comical in a way. It's sad, but it's, you read, God is so frustrated, he'll say, Moses, your people... And then Moses turned back to God. Hey, God, your people, neither one of them at times want to take ownership of them. (laughs) (laughs) And sometimes we can, some of the greatest hurts that we've ever had have come through church. That's just the messiness of church, folks. That's just life. Well, you know what? My salvation is more important. I'm not going to get bitter. Okay, I, I might be reeling, I might be hurt, but I'm going to keep trusting God. I'm going to keep my spirit right. I may, I may, need, may need to pull away a little bit, uh, but I'm going to keep my trust in God. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that. God is the only, only help that I've got. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord. Amen. It comes from the Lord. Amen. Psalms 51 and and verse 12. David says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When you're going through it, your joy is gone. But God is a restorer. And we'll say, God is a restorer. Look at Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57, and let's look at verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Watch. To revive. To revive. To bring back to life. In other words, to restore. To revive the spirit of the humble. And to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, neither will I always be wroth, for the spirit should fail before me. And the souls which I have made. In other words, God's saying here, look, I'm a, you know, Israel's being chastised. I'm not going to give you so much chastisement that, that it kills you. God saying, I know the limitations of humanity. He said, verse 17, for the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth and smote him. I hid me. God hid himself from Israel for a moment and was wroth and he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. 
I have seen his ways. I have seen his ways. So Israel sinned, full of iniquity, full of pride. But God's come along and says, I want to revive you. I want to restore you. Watch. I have seen his ways and will heal him. God says, I want to heal you. I will lead him also and restore. I want to say restore. And restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. Restore. Restoration. It didn't look like it for Israel, but there's restoration. I want to say restoration. restoration. There's restoration. You can have restoration. You can be restored. You got some time for a few more scriptures? How about Jeremiah chapter 30? And I, I'm, I, okay, the plane right now, we've been at cruising altitude. The engines just are decreasing and we're beginning our descent. For those of you that are watching your clocks and watches. Jeremiah 30, verse number 16. Therefore, all they that devour thee shall be devoured, and all thine adversaries, every one of them, it was, say every one of them, one. shall go into captivity, and they that spoil thee shall be spoiled. Those that have taken all that you've got, your character, your integrity, and everything, you know what? They're going to be the ones that are spoiled. You know what spoiled means? It's not like a spoiled brat. You would spoil your enemy in time of war. You would take all their plunder, their gold, their silver, their livestock, their cities. You would spoil the enemy. And God is saying those that have spoiled you are going to be spoiled. And all they that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. For I will, what? Restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds. I would say restoration. Okay, you're in the process of being spoiled right now. You're in the process of being in captivity right now. You're in the process of all you hear, and it's the clackling of the adversaries. You've been devoured, and it has left you reeling. Okay, I'm, I'm taking too long. There's one point here, folks. God's going to restore you. God's going to restore you. What you've got to do is just trust God and trust the process and know that God is going to eventually restore you. Those that devoured you are going to be devoured. Those that have become your adversaries now, you know what? They're going to be the ones that are going to go into captivity. Those that have spoiled you will be spoiled. Those that you have been their prey, they're going to become a prey. God has a way. I had an old prophet tell my wife and I one time in the middle of all of our stuff, he said, God keeps good books. Yes, Mankind doesn't. God does. So take heart today. I hope I'm communicating. I want you to be encouraged today. You're going through it. That's not a sin. For, for you to be rattled in your emotions is not a sin. What would be a sin is denying God at the greatest time that you need him. Denying the truth at the greatest time you need him. That would be a sin. But it's okay to be hurting. It's okay to be reeling. It's okay to say, I don't understand what's going on. And I'm feeling emotions that I have really have never felt before. And I don't know what what to do what you do is you run to God and you do what David did that I will trust in thee that is your answer yes. friend it's easy sister Jones you better come it's easy to trust God when everything's going great Oh, man, I just got a new job, man, and my bank account looks great, and I'm getting a new car, and we got a new house, and, oh, man, this is wonderful. Boy, I sure trust God. This is great. Uh-huh. Okay, Job, let's go now. Let's see how much you trust God. I remember an old preacher came to our home church years ago. He said, how many of y'all want to be like Job? Man, everybody's hand goes up. Yeah. How many of y'all, no, how do you, no, let me rephrase that. How many of y'all want God to brag on you? That's what he said. How many of y'all want God to brag on you? Woo, yeah. He said he bragged on Job. <laughs> yeah, to the devil. You consider my servant Job? Job lost it all. All but his life. But you know what happened to Job? twice. That's restoration. A hundredfold. 
And you know what? Job never sinned with his lips. He cursed his day. He cursed the day that he was born, but he never cursed God. It's okay to reel. It's okay to have pain. It's okay to express. But in the, all of that, why was I even born? I don't understand why this is all happening. I don't get it. But I'm not going to charge God foolishly. God, I came into this world naked. I'm going to leave this world naked. Lord, you have given and you've taken away. Lord, you give me great seasons of plenty and great seasons of blessing. But right now I'm in a season that everything's been obliterated. I've lost my family. I've lost my kids. I've lost my spouse. Amen. I've lost my finances. I've lost my house. I've lost my business. Business. I've lost my job. I've lost everything. The one thing I refuse to lose is that, Lord, you're still my God. Job said, I'm still going to trust you. I'm going to still believe you. I don't understand all of it, but I'm going to still trust you. And because of that, through time, through time, God said, all right, Job, I'm going to give you everything back. A hundredfold. You're going to have double what you had. He's a restorer. In Joel, Joel chapter 2. And if you read the book of, of, of Joel, you'll see that Israel's in a massive judgment. Everything's been taken away. God sent in judgments to them. And then he comes back with a promise. And a prophecy. In verse 25, he said, And I will restore to you the years. See that word again? The years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer word, my great army which I sent among you. Now, earlier in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, God said, I'm going to send to you the locust, and what the locust hasn't eaten, I'm going to send the canker worm. What the canker worm did not eat, I'm going to send the caterpillar. What the caterpillar did not eat, I'm going to send a palmer worm. I'm going to destroy all your crops. Now God's coming back. He said, I'm going to restore it all back. And you're going to eat in plenty, and you're going to be satisfied, and you're going to praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. There's going to come a day, if you'll continue to trust God, that you're going to have a testimony that I went through the hardest thing I ever went through in my life. I went through some things that I never thought that I would ever go through. I suffered some hurt I never thought I would ever feel in my life. I went through rejection. I went through all kinds of stuff. I never thought I would ever suffer through something like this. But by the grace of God, I kept my trust in him. And I leaned heavy in the grace of God, Brother Troy. I lean heavy in the grace of God, Sister Penny. I lean heavy into that because that's all that I had. I had nothing else. Nobody else could understand what I was truly going through and experiencing. But God knew. And now I know in process of time that God has restored me. And now that I've got a testimony, Brother Jesus, that I look back and I say, man, I never want to go through that again. And the only way that I made it was by God's mercy and God's grace. And it was God's mercy and grace that worked on me because I trusted in him. I refused to get bitter. I refused to turn away from the presence of God but I position myself uh, that I'm going to be in the place in all my chaos and all my emptiness and all my confusion I'm going to be in a place where God's spirit can still move on me and God's word can still speak to me and through the process God's going to take your mess and he's going to make something beautiful out of it so grieve Okay, grieve. You're allowed to grieve. It's safe to grieve. It's healthy to grieve. When you suffer a tremendous loss, you go through stages of grief. First is denial. This didn't really happen. Second is anger. Why did this have to happen to me? God, why'd you have to do this and let this happen? I don't get it. That's important. Hey, God's big enough for your doubt. 
I remember my pastor, is this all right today? Uh, when, when he lost his mom, he was, he was young. His mom died of cancer, and Brother Koppel was under five. I don't remember the exact age, but he was just in a single digits, just, just a kid, baby, toddler. And when he got to Bible college, he'd always carried something in his heart. And when he went to Bible college, and he, this is public, he preached about this and talked to us about it. He got down, he says, God, he said, I want to be used, I love you. He says, but I've got to talk to you, and I've got to pour my heart out to you, and you're probably going to kill me during the prayer meeting. Because, you know, he, he was from the school taught, you know what, you just, you know, you better be careful how you approach God, you know, the old school, you know, okay. And he said, but I've got to get this off my chest. And man, he started praying, God, how come you let my mom die of cancer? How could you let this? And he just poured it out and poured it out and sobbing and crying and got it all out. And lo and behold, there was no rebuke. There was comfort followed by a calling. Birthed in that was birthed a calling. And restoration took place. God is big enough for you to go to him in prayer and lay it all out. Come unto me, all you perfect little people. Is that what he said? Come unto me, all ye that labor, that are heavy laden, and I will give you, you burdened today, you heavy laden today. How about casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Well, that care, that hurt, that pain, that area of restoration you need and you don't understand it, it includes that. Casting all your, you are in that verse, your care. Your care is in that verse. And Jesus is in that verse. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. He said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to restore. This is a promise to us, Percy. Now I think about it. Right after everything blew up in our life, this is one of the promises that God gave us. I am going to restore to you the years the locust hath eaten. It wasn't God right. We thought it was going to be months. It was years. And now we're starting to see it. The tale of two Sundays. <laughs> we may not know it this Sunday, but last week was a packed house. And a lot of Sundays are like that. And, and I was just, Timothy's like, man, we've got a lot of people. I said, yeah, but isn't it amazing that years ago this would have been a full crowd? You know? And God, and it's not about numbers. Don't misunderstand me. God knows where to plant us. Let's all stand today. My, heart's, my, my heart just is trying to reach for somebody today. The Holy Ghost is trying to encourage you. This is not the time to give up, not the time to quit. Bring your questions, bring your doubts, bring your fears, bring your confusion, and lay that all out on the altar to the Lord in your personal prayer time. And I promise you that if you'll do that and continue to trust God, you're going to get through this. You're going to make it. I remember our pastor telling us, now, son, look, you're going through the valley of the shadow of death. David said, yea, though I walk through. I would say walk through. Walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come for me. The valleys of life are intended to be walked through. He said, son, don't build your house in the valley that God is intending for you to walk through. Keep walking, child of God. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. It doesn't matter if it's slow, if it's fast. That's irrelevant. You will get to the other side. You will get out of this valley. It's a valley of a shadow of death. It is, it is, it is traumatic. 
This is not that I fell down and I skinned my knee situation. That's not a valley of a shadow of death. This is that you have been obliterated. And there is a little shadow of death hovering over you in the sense that there's no way that I can make it through this except God is with me and God is leading me and God is, is, is there helping me and assisting me. And that his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In the darkness of the shadow, God's word will guide my next step. He will make sure that I stay on the right path. His eye is on the sparrow and his eye is on you. Huh. So the word for you today is God is going to restore. You don't even recognize it right now because you're still reeling, but he, that process has already started. You may not feel like it, but that process has already started. Amen? All right. This is a word. Take this word. Hang on to this word. It's God's word. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a tool here. God is the one that restores. Okay? No, you don't need to come to a pastor and talk to a pastor for three hours about what happened. Because your pastor is human. You come to us and we'll pray for you. Yeah, that's fine. That's that, But ultimately, you need to go spend the three hours with the Lord and just keep digging in with God and keep digging in with God and keep digging in with God and digging into his word. And God's going to restore you. All right. Let's all lift our hands this morning. Hallelujah. My wife is going to sing. If you feel like you want to come to this altar and find a place to pray, these altars are open. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name.